Christmas, I traveled back to Canada to be with my family who I hadn't seen in two years. Thanks, COVID. We had some desserts, festive drinks, and of course, my mother's homemade lasagna. While I was there, I also happened to be tracking my glucose levels. You see, I was wearing this continuous glucose monitor to try out the metabolic health program from Levels, this video's sponsor. And I noticed my glucose levels behaving in rather peculiar ways. On these indulgent days with Christmas cookies and cocktails, my glucose levels were way more stable and had much smaller spikes. Well, this was very good, but also very unexpected. When telling my family about this phenomenon, they also wanted to know why this was happening. Does alcohol blunt glucose responses to food? Let's science it. Hey, welcome to Nourishable. I'm Dr. Lara. My family and I have been wondering, essentially, whether or not we should drink with every meal. So I've designed an experiment using myself as the guinea pig to see how different kinds of alcohol impact my blood glucose response to food. Each day for dinner, I'll eat the exact same meal, but vary whether I pair it with water, beer, wine, or a cocktail. I'm trying to keep other factors that can impact my metabolism consistent. So I'm avoiding eating and physical activity for three hours before and after my test meal. So this is day one of my experiment. So I'm just eating my meal with water and I've opted for these frozen veggie lasagnas and a big Caesar salad. In total, it turns out to be a pretty fat and carb laden meal with not much protein and only four grams of fiber. Not exactly the most gourmet, but at least it'll be consistent. 15 minutes. Bon appétit! And don't worry, Mom, your lasagna is way better. Whew! Okay, that was really fast to eat all that. <laughs> um, so now I'm just gonna sit tight for the next three hours and let my body do its thing. Here's my no alcohol data, with time along the x-axis and glucose level along the y-axis. Since this was a really carb-heavy meal without much protein or fiber to slow down absorption, I saw a pretty big spike. Physiologically, what's going on is I'm starting to digest the starch from my lasagna here. Then it's broken down into small glucose molecules in my intestine to then be absorbed into my blood. That's why we see this rise in my glucose levels here. These rising glucose levels trigger the hormone insulin to be released from the pancreas. Insulin then circulates around my body and opens up the glucose doorways on my cells so that my muscle and fat tissue can take in glucose from the blood, which allows my glucose levels to return back to baseline. Today is the beer exp- Ooh. Hey, you have, to, you have to hang out over there, okay? This isn't about Elliot right now. Today is beer experiment day. So I have selected this uh, 16 ounce um, double pig's ear. So it's a brown ale, it has 8.4% alcohol content. And the reason that I selected this is I wanted to, first of all, pick a kind of beer that I like. I haven't actually had this kind before, but it tends to fall within my flavor profiles, but also something where you would naturally drink the entire can in kind of one serving and would call that one drink, when in fact, if we calculate how many grams of alcohol are in this, it actually counts more as two drinks, since one drink is equivalent of 14 grams of alcohol. Cheers. This is what I call day drinking for science. Okay, I'm gonna be, I'm not fo totally following my protocol. I'm gonna be a little, a few minutes extra finishing my meal. Okay, so I guess it's more reasonable that it takes me about 21 minutes to, oh, ooh, sorry, excuse me, uh, to speed eat all of this food and drink this drink. So a bit of a deviation from my planned protocol. Um, but that's how science works sometimes. It's gonna sit tight for the next two hours and let my blood glucose do its thing. Should we right snuggle a doggy into the experimental protocol? Here's my beer data in purple compared to my no alcohol data in blue. Based on my holiday observations, I expected to see less of a spike, but Curiously, that's not what happened. Looks like when I drank a beer with my meal, I got a faster rise and a higher spike in glucose levels. 
Maybe this is because beer, like lasagna, is also high in carb content, and the beer carbs cancel out the effect of alcohol, but I'm not too sure. So it is day three, which is wine, Park family, beverage choice. This is nine and a half ounces of this lovely Pinot Noir, which also works out to about 30 grams alcohol. Cheers. Well, the wine data in red is pretty similar to the no alcohol in blue. So far, neither of my alcohol experiments blunted my glucose response, which is different from my observations during the holidays. This is frankly a bit perplexing. Though, come to think of it, there was something different about how I drank during the holidays. For example, my cousin Jamie poured me a big old glass of Canadian wine upon walking in from the frigid cold. So I started drinking before my meal and continued to drink during dinner. So maybe the timing of alcohol exposure impacts how my body metabolizes my meal. So this is day four of my experiment and I'm gonna repeat the wine, but with a twist. So this time I'm gonna drink the exact same amount of wine, but I'm gonna start drinking my wine 15 minutes before I start eating my meal. This is called the cocktail hour amendment to the protocol. Okay, time to eat. Hold on. Cocktail hour was a success. Compared to my no alcohol in blue, the pre-meal wine in rosé yielded a lower and more stable glucose response. This is what we are looking for. So why would this pre-meal alcohol blunt my blood glucose? Well, this isn't completely consistent from study to study, but there's some evidence that alcohol primes the pancreas to release more insulin in response to blood glucose. Or in other words, alcohol may boost glucose-stimulated insulin secretion. If more insulin is released when I've absorbed the lasagna carbs, then the glucose can be taken into cells faster, preventing the blood glucose from ever peaking with such a high spike final day of the experiment. Thank goodness I don't need to eat the frozen lasagna anymore. And today is cocktail day. So I am gonna make myself a Manhattan because I like them. This is really fun. This also works out to 30 grams of alcohol. And a cherry on top. Gonna model the cocktail hour again. Okay, and time to dig in. <sighs> Thank goodness this experiment is done. Compared to no alcohol in blue, the pre-meal Manhattan does yield a lower peak, though I don't completely return to baseline in the three hours after my meal. So we're seeing a bit of a blunting with the cocktail, but not as suppressed as the pre-meal wine in rosé. Definitive proof that wine is the best of all alcohol. Putting all the data together into this colorful jumble, we see that drinking a beer with my lasagna yielded the highest and fastest spike. Bad news. Drinking wine with my meal didn't have much of an impact, but starting to drink my wine before my meal caused the most gradual rise and stable glucose response. My cocktail of choice blunted my glucose spike a bit. So in terms of seeking more stable glucose responses, the clear winner here is the pre-meal wine. This experiment was controlled as well as possible, though I did have to alter my eating habits to get the consistency I needed. In my day-to-day -day life, I usually don't finish a meal in under 15 minutes, family lasagna or otherwise. Plus, effects may be noticeably different with alternative drinks, 
especially sugary cocktails. And several studies have shown the impact of alcohol on metabolism may be really dissimilar if you're fasting or on a ketogenic diet. In cases like these, there could be a greater risk of glucose levels dropping, resulting in low blood sugar. Because as it turns out, alcohol reduces how much glucose the liver can synthesize. Plus, the glycogen stores would be depleted and therefore ineffective at bringing glucose back up. There could also be big swings and risk of hypoglycemia with alcohol if you're managing diabetes. So talk to your doctor about how to safely consume if that applies to you. So what do we do with this information? Should you get into the habit of a pre-meal wine every day to blunt your blood glucose response? I think we need some nuance with this interpretation. While some evidence suggests that moderate drinking is associated with a lower risk of type 2 diabetes, heavy drinking seems to increase risk. Moderate drinking is defined as one drink per day for women or two drinks per day for men. Typically, we count one drink as the number of vessels of beverage that we've had. One can of beer, one glass of wine, one margarita. But here's the catch. The actual definition of one drink is 14 grams of alcohol. So that works out to <laughs> So that works out to 12 ounces of a 5% beer. Oh dear. Uh-oh. Or 5 ounces of a typical wine, which is usually about 12% alcohol. I never drink such a tiny glass of wine. Whereas this uh, 16 ounce, 8.4% beer works out to more than two drinks per this definition. So in my experience per this definition, I think we tend to drink a greater number of drinks than we think we do. I would also point out that while the pre-meal wine stabilized my spike, the suppression wasn't that drastic. My glucose level still rose to 136 milligrams per deciliter, which is higher than what Lovells considers a healthy threshold. My read of this data is that, simply, it isn't a good idea to drink for health reasons. There are many healthier ways to more effectively blunt blood glucose responses to meals, like going for a post-homemade lasagna walk. That's what science tastes like. Thanks to Levels for sponsoring this video so I could nerd out on data. If you want to learn about how your body uniquely responds to food and exercise, check out my link to the Levels program in the video description. And let me know if your findings are similar to mine. If you want to help support Nourishable in making more evidence-based nutrition science content, please support me on Patreon. Link in the video description along with all my references cited in this episode. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all things nutrition.